All right, can you guys text your friends to get down here immediately, please? All right, uh, hello everyone in whatever state or uh, literally state or medium through which you are uh, consuming this. Uh, it is very exciting that we're all here to uh, participate in this talk by Ashley Bigham. Um, this talk is the third in a short series organized by us, the third year undergraduate studio here at UIC, ARC 366. Our studio is titled Society of Rooms, borrowed from Lucan. And within the overall UIC curriculum, the studio traditionally explores topics related to interior urbanism. Uh, faculty for this semester of the, uh, the offering include Abby Chang, Palmira Guraki, Thomas Kelly, and Chris Fry. These talks are an opportunity to hear from experts as a channel for building knowledge and dialogue around the interior and models, specifically in the design process. Um, we're happy to be able to share these with folks uh, and students and other studios or anyone who'd like to see it. So welcome to everybody. Ashley, I'm very excited to introduce as a fantastic thinker, critic, designer, and person. Uh, she is an assistant professor of architecture at OSU. Prior to that, she was a Sanders Fellow at Michigan. She also holds a master's degree from Yale and a Bachelor of Architecture from Tennessee. In 2013, she co-founded Outpost Office with her partner, Eric Herman. The work is utterly fantastic, I will attest, and has won all the, oh no, that's how fantastic it is. <laughs> Everything wants to jump away and explode on me. Um, and they've uh, won every single award that I, uh, any office could win. So uh, I don't need to list them all, but suffice to say that they're uh, an office that works very hard uh, at testing the limits of architecture. Um, they have a number of ongoing sort of technique experiments and themes like the GPS computer controlled robot ground painting machine. They started working at near here at uh, Ragdale, which uh, you might be able to see a little bit about today and, and used to transform a basketball series of basketball courts in Chicago for the Chicago Architectural Biennial, not Biennale. I don't even know how that slipped in. It's not Biennale. This is in Italy. Um, this is just one of many tech technical explorations, architectural spatial explorations though, and whether through these full scale drawings on the ground or models that change scale across their volume to become inhabitable, the practice questions the act of translation, formatting and organization. Of course, interiors and models are part of all this as well as where model making for them as a design activity, uh, a communication tool, and sometimes it ends in and of itself. Please join me in welcoming Ashley Bigham. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart. That was really, really nice. Um, with that, I'm going to... Begin. Seeing correctly what you should be seeing. All good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so thank you again for, for having me. I um, am a big fan of the things that go on at UIC, uh, the students, the faculty, and the work that comes out of the school. So um, it's a real privilege to be a part of that uh, in this small digital way, but um, also have found myself in Chicago very recently, especially for um, the biennial project uh, over the past year. And so um, really, really love that city as well. Um, so our Outpost Office is an architectural practice that focuses on alternative formats and new timelines for the design, production, and obsolescence of architecture. Specifically, the practice is interested in new methods of prototyping space. So today I'm going to talk about our um, practice and do so through this lens of uh, the topic of your studio, which is models. Um, but in looking at the work of Outpost Office, um, models didn't seem to kind of encapsulate um, everything that we do. That's not a building per se, um, but maybe artifacts, objects, and models could be another way of thinking about this topic. So um, we playfully intermingle disciplinary tools and conventions um, that have shaped the artifice of the architect. So we play with tropes, not with tropes and features, but with tools of the trade themselves. So we are resourceful, not only as a matter of pragmatism, but as a method for speculation. We believe in the notion that architects are not inventors, but coordinators and orchestrators, maybe also organizers and formatters. We far prefer um, tapping into existing resources off the shelf technologies like our GPS guided robot, um, which we've kind of hacked, which was um, designed for drawing sports fields. 
So we revel in this kind of misuse, misappropriation, and misreading. Um, we believe that there are so many things in the world already, so we focus less on producing more of them um, and more on illuminating novel uses for what we have at hand. Um, much of this misuse occurs through the format of architectural drawing and modeling um, and the creation of architectural artifacts. So our office is full of artifacts, quite literally, as you can see behind me, um, so much so that when we were asked to think about um, uh, an exhibition entitled Baggage uh, here, we put in, um, we designed a neon suitcase and we put in some projects, some of our own, some canonical projects. You might um, recognize a few canonical projects there. Um, uh, and so we're always kind of surrounded by, um, let's say, designs, whether they're kind of um, in our heads, in our physical spaces, or um, in our office. Um, so we're also in a constant state of kind of categorizing and organizing the archive. So in some ways, the um, scenarios are more important. So we don't, we don't say that our practice produces objects, although obviously um, we do that, but instead of the objects, what we're really working on is to produce situations, scenarios, events, and happenings. So we speculate through objects, we model scenarios, and we create artifacts for events. Um, in that series, over the past few years, our office has been producing useless drawing instruments. So um, drawing machines that contradict the smooth and synchronous performances of most digital devices. So these machines are nonchalant, they're clumsy, um, and they're awkward. Um, in this particular machine called another maze, um, this brushed aluminum housing stores a nearly infinite stockpile of low resolution labyrinths. So unlike an archive, um, this accumulation is not a consequence of a database, but of the algorithm, an abstract act of compression and distribution. So the maze exists only as a potential drawing until the moment um, that, the bush, the, that the red button is pushed. Um, another precursor to this uh, research, and I should note that my partner in, <laughs> in Outpost Office, Eric Herman, originally developed some of these um, machines as, uh, when he was a fellow at Michigan. Um, and this uh, project called Another Campo Marzio is a drawing machine which suggests also alternative entanglements of historical material possi um, materiality possible through software and code. So here, this um, kind of useless machine uh, takes fragments of architectural history, recombines them um, seemingly randomly, uh, and prints this incredibly slow on a dot matrix printer. It revisits this work uh, in the um, inspiration of uh, Piranesi's uh, Campo Marzio. And for us, the tendency of digital databases to flatten information and remove causational relationships echoes the work of Piranesi in his original Campo Marzio etchings, where he freely recombined fragments um, with little or no regard to historical or archaeological precision. So everything was a bit um, out of sync or a bit out of context. So these artifacts um, may not be models in the traditional sense. Um, but you know, why learn from conventions of representation if not uh, to reimagine them? So these machines for us have been as useful as any single architectural model in that they are acts of speculation and that they are acts of organization. We also make models in the conventional sense, um, but we also combine them uh, with filmic techniques or low resolution animation sequence. So um, we are interested in producing images of models in addition to um, the physical object and, and often equally important. So um, as a fellow at the University of Michigan, um, my fellowship project, Safety Not Guaranteed, which was one of Outpost Office early projects, um, it used models in the history of modeling um, as a driving theme. So the design research um, and the exhibition brought together several research things that were going on in our office, including the proliferation of the American suburb, the impact of digital surveillance um, and defense architecture, and architectural typologies of the everyday American landscape. So I was interested in this um, um, kind of culture of safety and defense, which is found in the American suburb. And so in doing that, um, really looked at the history of the model as a representational device. 
So the physical model um, is still one of the most valued forms of visual communication, obviously why you're doing a studio this semester on it. Um, the inherent immediacy of the physical model allows the viewers to immerse themselves in the project. And so here really using also the scale and the size of the model to create that immersion. Um, the exhibition itself took on the um, form of three architectural models, um, each which drew specific inspiration in context and representation from historic precedents. So looking at the way that um, other forms of representation, um, most notably things like the bird's eye or axonometric or cabinet projection um, had all been developed for military purposes. And so they were all about kind of uh, depicting very accurately and being able to measure a three-dimensional drawing. Um, and so of course models can also be used in that way. And so there's a history again of this kind of overlap. Um, but what I was more interested in is, is um, maybe how those forms and techniques were infiltrating um, the American suburban landscape as a defensive tactic, um, maybe obvious or not obvious to um, participants of that. And also, um, Modeling is a kind of universal format of representation, which has been historically linked to these histories of architecture and the discipline of defense. Um, and another specific example, so one of the three models was the sand table. Um, and a sand table is a form uh, very commonly used and today still used um, in military training and actually active military situations, but it's a form of ad hoc modeling, which can be done in the field. And it helps teams of people um, who speak different languages communicate through spatial relationships. So it's about organizing territories, landscapes, marking grounds, and projecting futures. So I was interested in how maybe um, this form of modeling, which might seem in some ways quite playful, like a child's sandcastle, um, kind of uh, have that quality, but then also is used um, in very incredibly serious scenarios um, in wartime. And so really interested in how um, kind of think about two types of representation that were um, almost physically identical, right? Using sand, using small objects to place, um, to create a kind of field or a scenario, um, but how we're kind of doing those in each instance and with a very different uh, kind of outlook, a very different, um, yeah, very different outlook. Um, in our office, we've also started to look more at photography um, of the model as maybe more important than the model itself, or at least as another avenue of creating an image of a project. Um, so to do that, we use tools like the turntable, which you might recognize from um, displays on something like jewelry television on an infomercial. Um, so we like appropriating these tools of the trade, but mostly from trades outside of architecture. So film, photography, construction, or in this instance, retail. Um, models have also helped us convey characteristics um, and affects of projects what? that were not possible in, in renderings or um, drawings. Oh, never the, responded, there hasn't yet. So, okay, good. Mm. sorry, sorry, I hear some feedback, thanks. Um, it's unmuted. I think, I think they're muted now. It's all good. I think I got it. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, so sometimes a model can help us, um, again, kind of think about and convey a um, an affect or characteristic of a project that we're not able to do in rendering. So this model is actually um, produced after uh, the competition was entered, after the design was completed, but it was really actually to test certain things. We were very interested, this project was called Color Block, and we're very interested in the relationships um, between different faces of the material, also the shadows that were cast and incredibly subtle changes and shifts um, between fluorescent colors and matte colors. And so here in the foreground, you see this big kind of red bar, um, which one side is painted a fluorescent pink and the other side is painted a very bright red. And so we were interested in how the kind of shading um, of different surfaces could actually kind of enhance or um, maybe obfuscate sometimes the, um, the three-dimensional qualities of it. So could we get a three-dimensional object to look quite flat and, and vice versa? So again, here, kind of the kind of staging of the model becomes important in its sort of filmic technique. So in its composition and in its lighting uh, and in the scale figures even, which is probably something not to be, not to be overlooked, the use of scale figures. Um, then in other, other models, um, 
here's a model where um, we were working on also kind of collapsing the scale. So this was uh, for something that we wanted to build at full scale. So actually a piece of the model became a full scale prototype. So the kind of curved base of the model um, is a full scale part, which would be um, in the, and this is a kind of, um, anti-pavilion pavilion project, um, but in this ground game, as we called it. Um, so really kind of using the model as a way to um, invent a new way of uh, making SIPs uh, or a construction method that we were not sure um, would be possible. But again, we were um, kind of claiming that we could do that construction method. So the model actually became a test bed for a one-to-one -one scale prototype um, mixed with uh, a model base that was on top of it. So here you see also the patterns become to be a kind of juxtaposition of things that were at one to one pattern scale and um, the scale of the model. Um, <clears throat> another project, um, this was this was also um, my partner Eric's um, fellowship project from the University of Michigan um, is another digital. And I think this also kind of encapsulates almost more of what you see behind me, um, where it's an exhibition that reframes the fundamental um, tendencies and biases of the digital uh, mediated design. And it does that through um, a format. So it's not kind of thinking about the digital, not as an aesthetic or formal language, but rather as a format um, and also maybe an exercise of formatting and organizing. So it's a series of design proposals which fill this cabinet, which transfigure um, in form, scale, and material as they reoccur. Um, and so you start to see actually objects which occur in many different rooms, but also at many different scales. So there's this kind of embedded recursion of the scale of objects um, and artifacts as they move up. And so exactly what you're seeing here is a bit um, uh, less clear. So it's a gallery, it's a model of a gallery in a gallery. Um, but then even within that model, let's say, um, the scale changes on every level. So it doesn't quite hold to the conventional rules of scale and models. Um, so another stack, um, so the next project employs a strategy of ensembles, collections and objects, which can be viewed as a whole rather than um, individually. And so we often thought of it as embodying a model or embodying a drawing. So one of the questions we asked is, you know, could you feel like um, in a one-to-one -one scale um, installation or exhibition, um, or we called this an environment because neither one of those terms kind of worked um, for what we were doing, but could you actually feel like you were um, inhabiting the space of the model? Could you feel like you were inhabiting the space of the drawing? Um, so we used um, the circle, which is an archetype of spontaneous gathering and a recurring motif in the low resolution ensemble. We had these kind of chunky day gloom platforms. They evade easy identification. So are they sandwiches because they have the kind of sip um, sandwich look on the edges? Are they tables? Are they benches? Are they models? Um, so without the single definition term or archetype like a chair where you understand and expect how to react to that object, um, here, the user interaction is learned through group negotiation and modest acts of individual um, trial and success. So the furniture kind of eschews um, these various uh, prototypes or um, these kind of understood languages. Oh, and there's John right there. <laughs> um, and so here you see kind of students stacking and piling on um, these platforms. You see kind of lighting effects um, from down below. So again, kind of blurring what is that, the kind of physical quality of the model and then maybe the kind of image quality. So can we make the physical ob objects glow in the way that you can make um, objects on a screen glow, et cetera. There's no kind of correct way or incorrect way to arrange the pieces. Um, it was all kind of um, depending on what type of event. There was a um, kind of emphasis on a non-hierarchical organization so that um, when you had talks and conferences, um, students and um, professors were mixed together. There wasn't a kind of front row and a back row um, and that there were more kind of in the round configurations um, than kind of single speaker and audience configurations. So it was used um, for a series of uh, public events and workshop symposium. Um. Um, and as Stuart mentioned, our, some of our recent work um, has to do with uh, GPS guided um, robots. So here, 
um, projects that are interesting to think about in this because it's, uh, in this um, lecture, because as much as we love to um, make models and make drawings, we hardly ever make we well, we don't make models of these projects. Um, and uh, the models again are more the kind of um, installation of the actual artifact itself. Um, so here we're making um, pieces of temporary architecture. So there's a more kind of temporal quality to it. Um, and we wanted to see what, what we could do with this GPS guided robot to create architecture and to make architecture um, or to make space on an architectural scale, um, but do so in a very, very low impact way. So this is um, the same paint which is used for marking and the same robots which is used for marking something like a sports field, like a soccer field or a football field. Um, so again, there's kind of no harm to the ground. It's ecologically friendly. And um, importantly, there was no waste and no cleanup. So we began this um, project during um, COVID when it was actually impossible to get on a site and kind of fabricate any large scale thing with a team of people. Um, but then in doing that, we also kind of realized, you know, the kind of artifact qualities to it. So the material properties um, that we could see on the grass, the way it changed um, in the light. And also, again, using drawings, which are less drawings and more like animations, we could find these kind of calibration, um, or we could use this to calibrate, say, the pattern itself. And so it's a kind of prototyping or a kind of modeling, maybe a sort of digital modeling, um, where we're actually here running through um, many scenarios of kind of how this pattern can lock in. So here, obviously, too, we were looking at things like drone calibration patterns um, as inspiration for the form as well. Um, we've continued this work in various different ways and um, some projects I won't talk about too much, but here's one that we did at Texas A&M um, last weekend, actually, with a group of students looking at the theme of the, the labyrinth. And again, looking at how in every instance, you know, there's the overall drone shot, but then there are um, really things that we're a bit more interested in, which is um, how one maybe contorts their body to respond to the path, how one orchestrates movement with a group of people, the games that um, the students invented to play on it, um, the new sports that were invented, et cetera, the kind of rooms and things um, that they spent time in. So these were the kinds of, um, say, more kind of modeling of possibilities and like production of scenarios um, rather than a kind of singular artifact. Um, and since we were in, you're all in Chicago, you may have seen or um, you can still see, I believe it's still there, um, our project Cover the Grid, um, which is in the North Lawndale community um, in Chicago's west side where we took our robotic painting um, and to create a very different type of um, space and here one that was more responding to the interests and the desires of the community. And so here we were focusing on things like um, the basketball court as a really prominent um, asset to the community and one that working with the community they let us know was really important to them. Um, and then also looking at things like um, photographer's charts or a cyanometer. So other ways of using color and pattern and graphic um, to actually kind of um, be the first step of something to come after. So we didn't see our um, painting here as a kind of um, end to the project. It was more kind of middle space. So um, the court has been beloved and used by the community um, for many years. Uh, and it will continue to in the future. And so we saw our project again, not as the beginning or end of that process, but as just one kind of moment where we could use color and pattern um, to draw attention and to um, bring uh, eyes to the court in a way that maybe hadn't before. And so that also the community could um, design its future for itself. So they could design how they wanted the court to be used in the future beyond the things that they were already using it for. So in talking to the community, they wanted to um, add games in addition to basketball. So things like Foursquare and Hopscotch um, and these crosswalks. Um, we uh, were noticing that people use the site as a crosswalk every day. And so um, we kind of painted that uh, crosswalk in, but then of course also this, this kind of act of improvisation. So here at a block party, when we were just halfway through the painting, people came and they were dancing on the crosswalks. And again, just kind of allowing um, 
the architecture to be um, used in different ways for it to uh, kind of absorb and also reflect the multitude of activities that uh, the community wanted on the site. Um, and we're also looking at the ways that this kind of color and pattern again as a kind of artifact, so almost a kind of post occupancy artifact. Um, we're looking here at heat islands and um, thermal scanning of the site to kind of see what the impact is beyond um, just the kind of color and graphic. Um, so a longhouse uh, is a um, less of a discrete building design, but it is uh, it's a flexible prototype to densify suburban and exurban locales. Um, so a longhouse uh, crumples. Uh, the form can adapt to enigmatic demands in various sites. Um, but for this lecture, I think the most important thing is how this project actually was um, originally conceived of through a model. And so we had these kind of animations, we had diagrams, um, but much of the design work, let's say, for this project was really done through this really large scale model. Um, it was also done for an in-person exhibition, which um, would have been, um, at Woodbury in California, and then um, during COVID had to be kind of re, uh, let's say reconceptualized, but I think actually in the end, um, it was much, much better to um, stage it in these kind of empty retail storefront areas um, so that the, the piece kind of feels at home with this kind of messy, unfinished interior. And we were doing this project again, right kind of in the middle of COVID where obviously the, um, the kind of affordable housing crisis uh, in America was coming to a head. And also we were spending much more time in our homes and there was this kind of um, vast amount of empty commercial space and particularly in Columbus, Ohio, where we're based. Um, it was difficult to find housing, but yet um, at the bottom of all of these new kind of condos, there was these empty commercial spaces that they couldn't, that no, no one could lease. Um, even before and even since COVID, this is still an empty space. There's a kind of overbuilt commercial and an underbuilt um, residential issue. And so we're really looking at this as a way to think about collective housing, multifamily housing, multi-generation housing, but to do so through the model. And so here, you know, using this low grade residential construction materials like OSB, like the aluminum struts, um, there's this applied graphic of the fluorescent, this high visibility yellow, which brings the model um, some vibrance and also um, kind of brings life to this subdued um, muted palette of grays, tans, and beiges. So again, the, the model itself um, became an important uh, design artifact. Um, it also um, became important that it come apart and go together with no fasteners and no glue. And so um, in that way, there was a kind of crudeness to the way that it um, came together. And this was all based around the idea that we would break it down, drive it across country, put it back up in various cities across, all of which, of course, um, never happened because of COVID. But again, um, the actually conceiving of the model in that way allowed us to think about the actual design for the house project um, differently than I think we, we would have prior. So here you can see that again, that kind of sort of crude details, not the sort of beautiful, clean detail that um, an architect might typically want. But again, all of this was actually to express this idea of the flat packability, to express this idea of quick assembly, um, and also to express the idea that um, possibly the ideal image um, of the house was not one that was kind of close up, but we were really producing an image for the public, um, one that might be even seeing it through this storefront window, again, in this kind of um, underdeveloped or maybe overdeveloped and underserved uh, community. Um, so in addition to this um, project as a model, it also exists um, as a piece of software. Uh, and so I don't know where software fits into your, you know, our categories of um, artifacts, objects, and models. It's probably um, somewhat of a model, um, but it was important for us to kind of make this, um, kind of lagging, but um, you can actually um, make your own longhouse. So you can go to longhouse.outpost-office.com. Um, and so it's a piece of software that runs um, all the time and you can um, click, click, um, make your own longhouse and it kind of folds up and, and makes it itself. Virtually the video is kind of lagging, but another reason to go try it out for yourself. Um, 
but the idea there is that again, every every version of Longhouse is valid. So there's no kind of ideal version of the Longhouse. There are two which we built as models, um, but every version that is created is a version of of Longhouse because the project is an idea rather than any one kind of single form, right? Again, it's much more like a model. Um, so the last two projects, this perfect timing, um, last two projects um, are um, kind of about this topic of fulfillment, um, which I see as, um, uh, as a logistical, a material, and a cultural issue in architecture. Um, and I curated an exhibition and organized a symposium and there will be um, a forthcoming book on this topic. And so within this, I'm gonna just show a few images um, about this, um, this forthcoming, well, part of the project is, is done and then the rest of the project is coming. So it's a kind of two year long um, project. Um, but Fulfilled Architecture, Excess and Desire considers the role of architecture in a culture which is shaped by the excessive manufacture and assuagement of desire. So with the rapid growth of e-commerce, our understanding of fulfillment has evolved to reflect a seemingly endless cycle of desire and gratification, one whose continuity hinges on our willingness to overlook the cultural, economic, and environmental impacts of our ever-increasing expectation for quick and efficient fulfillment. Um, so for this exhibition, I asked 40 designers uh, to submit contents for storage and display. Um, the only requirement um, to submit something to this exhibition was that it had to arrive in a USPS priority large mail box. So that's a 12 by 12 by um, 12 almost, um, uh, or sorry, it's 12 by 12 by six uh, box. Um, and so they had to ship uh, whatever they were wanting to exhibit in the exhibition to in within this box. Um, the gallery was conceived of as off-site storage, so it was organized around um, IKEA shelves that were held together with polyester strapping. Um, it had motion-activated LED tube lights, so it would only light up when you walked into the gallery. Um, in each box, um, the contents would be on display for the duration of the exhibit, about one month. So kind of playing off this idea that um, most rental storage rental companies um, give you one month for free before um, I would return the, the model back to them. Um, so the submissions um, that I received from people generally fit into kind of three categories. So um, most or some uh, used the box for the storage or the transportation of miscellaneous materials related to their creative practice. So here is Moss, for example, who sent um, various models, but also prototypes, um, materials, a beanie, a tote bag, more kind of ephemera and artifacts. Um, there were also designs that focused on the potential particularities of the box itself. So really delving deep into the cardboard box, the dimensions of it, um, the box as a medium. So here, medium office looking at the box as a medium where this kind of infinite nested box um, is then kind of revealed with the even tinier box and finally a kind of drawing of the box itself. So that the, the kind of content of it is that. Um, and then there were designs that utilized the constraints of the flat rate logistical system, um, but they projected architectural objects which were unrelated to the medium itself. So here, Tate Projects um, uh, created a model of a house, but again, it was a kind of unfolding thing which fit directly into um, the box or Bureau Spectacular, which um, used the kind of lightweightness and ubiquitous of foam, um, both in the shipping industry and in the architectural modeling industry, let's say, um, to make a kind of model out of foam which fit into the box. So it's really unclear is this is this the container? Is this the housing for something? Or is this the model itself? Um, or here off is a three, um, an incredibly heavy, heavy kind of wax um, print, which took advantage of the fact that um, there was almost no weight limit for the box. So there was this really strict size limit, but it could be as heavy as it could. Granted, um, the, the cardboard kind of barely survived the, the weight of it. Um, or Office Kovacs here, where again, uh, kind of using uh, the constraints of the dimensions, but projecting another kind of speculation forward. Um, I also had um, actors come and open and interact with these models. So here's a model by Dylan Kruger, actually one that's 
one of the few on my on my shelf here that's not by outpost office um, where these hired student actors would engage they would touch the models they would kind of perform an unboxing ceremony around the model engaging in this kind of um, e-commerce and communication uh, phenomenon let's say of the unboxing and they were displayed here So um, just to finish out in the last couple of minutes, um, I'm going to talk about this project Open Work, which is another kind of curation and organization of, of models. Um, and this, this project took, took place in, um, in Kharkiv in Ukraine uh, in 2019. So in 2014, I was a Fulbright Fellow in Ukraine, and since then, um, Outpost Office, myself and, and Eric, have maintained a close relationship to the architectural community in the country fostering educational opportunities for American students to learn about Ukraine through study abroad experiences and engaging Ukrainian students in their academic work as we did here. So in 2019, Outpost Office was invited to work with the formerly, the newly formed um, Kharkiv School of Architecture, which was Ukraine's first independent school of architecture. Um, so as, we, as I talk to you this evening, um, uh, obviously, uh, Russia's full-scale invasion and attempted destruction of Ukrainian people and cultural heritage has been occurring for about six weeks. Um, Ukraine has been battling this invasion since 2014, but we've all witnessed this horrific escalation over the past few weeks and today. Um, and so I just want to use this opportunity to um, stand in solidarity with our Ukrainian colleagues. Um, and I want to show this project um, as a tribute to their resilience in the face of unimaginable challenges. Um, and I was reminded as I put together this lecture, this um, quote, which I came across a few years ago from Lewis Mumford in 1941, um, obviously at the beginning of World War II, where he had been invited to do a series of lectures at Alabama College um, and kind of had a had a back and forth with himself on um, whether he should do them, what he should talk about um, and how he should kind of either address or, or not address the current theme of the day. And so I just wanted to to kind of offer this um, and share that I'm sharing this project also um, kind of asking all of you as students and citizens of the world to um, be aware of what is going on in Ukraine and also to consider ways that we can help. Um, but what you won't see in the news about Ukraine um, are some really amazing changes that have been happening since 2014 after the Revolution of Dignity won in the sphere of higher education. Um, so two years or one year after the Kharkiv School of Architecture began, they invited um, us to come and help them organize a kind of end of year exhibition. Um, so the first thing that we did, being a little bit unfamiliar with what the students had been working on through that year, was this kind of... Um, uh, act of stock, taking stock and really understanding what the students had been learning. And then one thing that we kept continue to kind of um, reoccur and see um, in this new model of architectural education in Ukraine um, was the kind of emphasis on the, on the artifact and the, the model as a kind of primary um, artifact, um, but also the kind of ephemera and um, all of the objects, let's say tools, um, and sort of the things that you're seeing in the background there, the furniture, um, the promotional materials, um, everything that kind of makes an architecture school. So we were really wondering kind of what is the material culture of an architecture school? Obviously it's the things that the students produced, the drawings and the models, um, but actually there's so much more even that goes into um, the kind of culture of um, objects and artifacts in architecture schools. So we were really interested in kind of seeing what um, what that was for them. Um, and our approach also in this um, drew from some research I had been doing on organizational and material systems in open air markets and bazaars in Ukraine. So this is a, this is a bazaar in Kharkiv um, where I had been looking at organization and tectonics and display methods that are found in these markets. Um, so in a country which is often, I think, characterized by scarcity, these spaces um, have the unique ability to perform aesthetic acts of abundance. Um, and we also were, you know, 
working with models and built constructions here in a quite different way, one which tested skills of bricolage, um, a term used by Claude Levi Strauss, which is about simply kind of making do with the materials at hand. So here we're doing a design build installation um, and we don't, um, we can't quite jump in our car and drive to Lowe's or Home Depot as we would probably do in the US. Um, everything had to fit in a very tiny compact Uber. Um, we mostly shopped at bazaars uh, and open air markets. And we kind of moved up in the hierarchy of the market to actually buy wholesale um, materials that were used to construct other parts of the market. So we were kind of working um, within the supply chain of the market or bazaar itself um, in a way to procure materials that were um, affordable um, and also kind of would serve our purpose of being used and also reused over and over again. There's an incredible culture of material reuse in Ukraine um, and one that we wanted to make sure that we were respecting. And so um, here we made um, the entire exhibition with no uh, kind of hard, hard attachments. So everything was zip ties. So at the end of the exhibition, they could kind of cut it apart um, unfold it and it would become other things in, in the school. And so these the screens that um, are used at bazaars here um, were repurposed later for pinup boards or tables or um, info boards, just various different things. The same with the kind of lights and the, and the tiles as well. Um, the exhibition itself also kind of encouraged touching, touching, handling, and exploring the objects, much like the act of shopping encourages physical interaction with one's environment. Um, so the exhibition kind of portrayed this messy, creative, ambitious learning environment in the way that it was organized and designed. Um, and so I kind of end the talk here where it began, uh, which thinking with uh, thinking about ways that we at Outpost Office use architecture to organize our surroundings, to communicate with others who may not share a common language, and also to engage um, in the world. So thank you. And I would be happy to take uh, questions or comments. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. I really, truly appreciate your, your time and, and thoughts and, and uh, uh, calls of, of action and understanding. And um, our, the, the studio officially ends at 5.50. Um, so we've got like five minutes for official question time. But if, if people need to leave and run over and it runs over, I think that should be OK, too. So. Um, are there any questions or thoughts uh, from anyone? Uh, I've got some prepared if, if you need a minute to think of them, but um, please, uh, I don't know if uh, Jane has access to the, um, the, the YouTube questions. And there was also a question in the chat on Zoom along the way, which my question actually relates to. So I thought maybe the people in this room, I could open it up. If you have any questions I can relay, um, if you have any. No additional questions on YouTube so far. Okay. This is a multimedia extravaganza. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, every angle. Yeah, <laughs> got it covered. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, I guess I'll ask my question. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's a really selfish question because it's kind of something that I feel like we're, we're dealing with in this studio that I kept asking myself why your work works uh in certain ways that has to do with something i think that we're wrestling with so that's what i wanted to ask about and it has to do with what you were saying about how you're making models to take photographs of mm -hmm. them or you are making physical spaces that are meant to look or to feel like you're in a model that's kind of like translation of medium as being a comp an important component almost to the kind of efficacy or or kind of uncanniness of some of the moves that you're making and I, th I think certain projects or certain artifacts maybe stand on their own more than other artifacts. And I think in our studio, people are kind of wrestling with the fact that there's not going to be a, a building that they're going to be able to prove that when an architecture kind of looks like a model, that mm -hmm. it's going to be awesome. Instead, it's a model <laughs> that looks like an awesome, like a model. <laughs> and, the, you know, like they're because we are really thinking through the tectonic of the model making to kind of suggest an architecture that might not yet or not otherwise be conceived. But when it stays in model form, it kind of, you know, loses some of that efficacy sometimes. And I, and, 
you know, we have conversations about its kind of self-consciousness as a model and, and how, do, how does one kind of communicate and display that. And I think, you know, like the longhouse, I think, for instance, probably stands on its own more than others uh, for various reasons, probably because it uses a material that's not so common, a uh, model making material, as well as the way that it sort of indexes its life as a flat pack and stuff. So the tectonic of that thing is yeah. determined from the outside. But I guess I was wondering your thoughts about that as a kind of problem when you are creating a thing that stays in its side of its medium, maybe it suggests other mediums, but it's really kind of its thing, but it's tectonic is meant to kind of suggest other realms and other other ways of reading it when it's not meant to be understood as a multiple as say the other work the last work where it was like okay when we aggregate it it, it does its thing i don't know if you have any thoughts i'm mean, just not really a question yeah. 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 That. yeah yeah no that's i mean that's very interesting i mean i've often like dreamed of doing this kind of like a studio where we don't do drawings and just do models so i'm so excited to hear how it, how it's working and coming out for you um, uh, but yeah, I, so I, yeah, so you're kind of at a moment, right. Where like, that's the natural next step of always in a studio where you're like, here's the model. And we have to understand from that moment, like, is the model a kind of, um, a sort of real or, or let's say genuine, um, representation of the, of the idea of the building or of the building. Right. Or and sometimes maybe those can be the same thing. But like I think in a, in a studio scenario um, and I would say the longhouse. Um, yeah, is one where I think we were um, I think we finally kind of cracked this like ability. And I don't think we were intentionally trying to do that. But I think looking back, we kind of finally like figured out how the um, let's say the method or the spirit of the model would also be the spirit of the building, but that they're not exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the chat, there's this question about the gap where the roof slopes meet, because that looks strange if you're looking at it as a model of a building um, to have a kind of hole in the, um, <laughs> but if you're looking at that um, as an image, right? We wanted very distinct, this, this kind of line that you begin with. So the script or the code of the building begins with this idea that you could draw a line and any line that you draw can become a longhouse. And so that line, it was very, very important for us to be able to visualize and see that line. Um, and we chose to do that kind of with these fluorescent lights so that at night you would see this kind of fluorescent light of the line being the kind of driving force of that particular longhouse. Um, and so, you know, there that kind of, let's say more abstract um, design move uh, comes then in contact with the OSB, which is the kind of most like construction-like material, um, residential construction everywhere in America, the USB is there whenever you're making a house, right? And so taking these two things, like say maybe something that's a bit more abstract and then something that's a bit more kind of, um, it's also one-to-one -one scale, right? So it takes the um, the texture of the material and puts it out on the model at a scale which is not natural to model, but is completely natural to building industry and building construction. So the, the legs of those models were garage door headers um, at a moment where during COVID you could not find garage doors in America. <laughs> like if you were doing a house, there was like a national garage door shortage, but there were tons of headers for some reason, you know, because they're just much easier to make and ship and things like that. So we were, you know, kind of thinking through these, like these logistics. And in that project, we were kind of, uh, I guess, borrowing from, from both disciplines, say like the actual residential building discipline and then the um, model making tradition discipline. Any any questions we have for Ashley? Yeah. Do you want to come up and ask that or do you want me to translate? Oh, I can can she, can you hear her? No, <laughs> sorry. 
Uh, well, so my understanding of the question was that our, our reading of the animations that you showed or the video that you showed um, is at five frames per second because that's what Zoom does. Yeah. Uh, so it makes everything either look like a GIF or a stop motion animation. Yeah. And the question I think is, when was the stop motion animation um, part, of the kind of low fidelity part of the presentation of the video component? And when was it actually high res and we were seeing it in low res? Was there a moment where the, it was supposed to be real high res and that was a component of uh, conflict yeah. With, the, yeah. with the content? Yeah. Is that, your, is that valid? Okay, okay. That's a good point. Um, I think I was, like, just to answer the question very straightforward, um, I think almost every single one should have been really smooth, except the last one that was that was done in Ukraine. That one truly was a stop motion because we truly were going up and clicking the camera every, um, I don't know, 20 seconds or what. Like somebody like really actually was doing that. Now, sometimes we do make GIFs, like drawings that are GIFs that kind of cycle through a series of possibilities. Um, but uh, most of the things I showed today, and that's why I went a little quick through the videos because I realized they were they were lagging. So I hope it wasn't too annoying. But um, uh, most of the things are actually kind of pretty smooth, and that is to actually fall away, right? Because that's the kind of seamless digital world that we live in and expect to live in. So just as your question has pointed out, if there's any kind of disruption in that, we feel it as a disruption. And so you pay actually attention to the fact that it's an animation. Like I would like actually a lot of those drawings and maybe um, on our Instagram account, you can see all the videos at full resolution, right? So we'll use this kind of cloud to, to um, allow you to watch the videos in the way that they want to be presented. Um, but the idea is that they're kind of drawn so that they like the lines appear to be drawn. Um, and then also kind of um, was able to do this presentation with no conventional drawing, which I thought would be easy. But then I realized I kind of wanted also the animations. And then, you know, the, the question about is the video um, an artifact uh, more than a drawing? And um, how can also then the video come back, the kind of animation of the drawing come back and influence the architecture? And I think that's something in Longhouse we did a series of animations. We actually kind of worked on figuring out the thickness of the polychromy. So the kind of striping, the um, yellow and OSB striping that's on the model. We had a, we had a, an animation drawing that would kind of go from zero to hundred. And we would again, kind of use that animation to figure out kind of how we wanted that to be presented. Gotcha. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to translate? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So the question was about the another Campo Campo Marzio project, um, and had to do or in the, my interpretation of the question, which I don't know if is the actual question, uh, was if you could clarify maybe some of the the goals uh, or the the yeah the intended outcomes of seeing that that those rearrangements um, yeah. was that. Were the goals for you to see new things? Was it for an audience to see new things? What were some of those new things? Yeah. Um, things like yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. So <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, th that was that's really interesting. So I think we were, you know, looking at the original Campo Marzio drawing. Um, <clears throat> it's fragments of Rome, some real, some projective, some that didn't exist, some that existed at different time periods, but never together. It's a, it's a kind of flattening of history. And so we were interested in what might that look like today and also what that might look like through a kind of digital lens, right? Um, we were also, it was a kind of, um, it's a sort of a, a, a practice Eric started to kind of waste not waste time, but as like a hobby, which then I kind of picked up and joined in on, which was to see if you could, if we could draw canonical architectural plans using only ASCII symbols. So you had to use kind of parentheses, dashes, dots, uh, 
pound signs, et cetera, hashtags, stars. So you had to use only these kind of ASCII symbols. And could you actually communicate the, the kind of, could you make it identifiable? Could you, could you draw a plan? And it would be identifiable as a building that another architect could identify again without, without language. So again, kind of distilling everything down to this sort of universal language. Um, by putting them together across time and space by kind of flattening it, by putting it through this antiquated dot matrix printer, by allowing the, agri um, the algorithm to kind of randomly pick and put a Palladio right beside a Hayduck. Um, we were also interested in, in the kind of obliteration of, of history in some way and actually kind of lessening the, um, let's say the heaviness of the canon and like how we could actually kind of free ourselves in some way. Um, from things that have come in the past while, while still understanding maybe there's a kind of new potential for them and understanding them in the future. Um, and so in, in many, it was a kind of experiment where I think the why we were doing it was not so clear when we started doing it. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time <laughs> and, then, and then kind of, you know, just continued to develop and like even just solving the kind of technical aspects of that project is, you know, has leaked into the practice in, in other ways. Um, understanding like how to draw um, different types of plans using only ASCII symbols is like actually a, a great kind of exercise for understanding building organization <laughs> because, you know, it's just all the same principles of proportion and uh, symmetry and ace. It's all the sort of things that you learn very early in architecture school, but it's just kind of learned through a different different format. Awesome. Thank you for question. Okay. All right. Well, I think that was probably a great time to end it. It's also exactly six, so we can kind of give you your your full <laughs> hour. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, yeah. It was amazing. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so for much. having me. Bye, nice to see you. <laughs>